United States, a place where there were once 20 brokerages, now there are just two. Today is an opportune time to become an NFA regulated Forex broker. Would you do it? I certainly would. North America, home to only, place. great place, best place ever. Home to only two retail brokerages these days, Oanda Corporation and Gain Capital. Interactive Brokers has gone towards ECP business. Mm -hmm. And going back just a few years, there was about 20 to 25 retail OTC brokerages in America. Many of them were not American. Now, only the American-owned and American-managed companies are still in, in existence. And now with the, with the demise of FXCM mm -hmm. and the potential fallout from that, mm -hmm. customers are left not only worried about where they're going to put their capital, but also with only two choices. Mm. The question is, when do we start a brokerage in America? Well, good point. Because if you look at the actual exit of the non-US firms, it started post 2008-2009 yes, crisis. Yes, it did. What actually happened then is that the Fed came up with new rules, and the rules said that where, in order to avoid another scandal of the 2008-2009 Lehman's banking Bear Stearns crisis, yes, it's going to increase the capital requirements, capital regularly capital that has to be held on deposit. The financial strengths of the companies have to be particularly large. That's right. And that immediately. And they dropped the leverage down on FX to 1 to 50. They did indeed, yeah. So with those two affronts coming on the FX market, the foreign firms looked at it and said, okay, commercially, it's not worth That's our right. while. That's right, they did say Commercially. That. So they've got to allocate a lot of money to stand up to the, re the, the requirements of the regulator. And in addition to that, they're not going to be making enormous money because they're not going to be offering margin That's to the right. FX customers. But I think they were wrong. This was a very short-sighted and very mm. rash decision on most of them to exit the market. And the, the diatribe at the time, which I also didn't agree with, was from outside the US, mm -hmm. this is not a viable market. There's no way that it's worth it. We could get out. But it's the, if you look at the companies that have had bases there and have got out, they're all ones who couldn't hack it in America. Right. IBFX, Japanese company, it's Monex Group, got out. But they were kicked out by the NFA because they were constantly undercapitalized and they were, they were actually selling. About three years ago, they got caught mm. uh, warehousing trades and selling off the smaller deposits to a market maker. Yeah, but they were actually in breach, Andrew. They were in completely breach of some in breach. of the rules. Completely in breach. So that's one angle, that's being one. in breach yes, of the rules. Is. So that type of business is probably better out. Yeah, However, most some, certainly. There, there was, was a few. ILQ was another one. They were right. out for, the, for similar reasons. Undercapitalization, having, a, having doubt over where their capital was coming from. It right. was another entity. Then you have all the good quality non-American companies that had offices there. Like FX, FX Solutions. Solutions. Exactly, mm. FX Solutions. They sold out to gain capital. They did. There was a few others, British, Australian companies, mm -hmm. some all over the world that had offices there, but they didn't want to go the hard yards. Mm -hmm. So it was left with four or five American companies, really five, you know, and uh, Gain Capital, Interactive Brokers, FXCM, and um, <clears throat> in the end, Trade Station, you know, IBFX Trade Station, mm -hmm. which is the US division. Yes. Um, and now you're down to two. But the thing is this, the American customer is a long-term loyal customer which can't deposit funds outside the US mm -hmm. and will not want to usually they're very analytical the average deposit side in the US, in the US is six thousand eight hundred dollars not right. not three thousand eight hundred like it is everywhere else in the world mm -hmm. many of them have multi-asset portfolios it's a it's a an investment environment that's very high tech and is mm -hmm. centered on the futures industry in Chicago mm -hmm. so look at it like this you now put down 20 million regulatory capital you put five million to set up your operating costs and get your responsible officers and mm -hmm. set up your office. You need certain key people. You then go to a platform developer. You must have a bespoke platform in America because it's very much, um, you're competing with Gain or Oanda who all have their own bespoke Proprietors, platforms. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. so did TradeStation and so did, so did FXCM. They are, for the requirements of the market, you can get that done by C-Trader, for example. They will make you a custom platform for the fraction of the cost of developing your own. Um, and then that's the start, 25 million to start. And then you have to put up your initial cost to try and get customers, which will be easy. It's easy. It's a willing, ready market for good quality brokerage that will go the hard yards and show the public mm. that they are stable and they're serious and they're going to behave themselves. Mm -hmm. It's an easy market. 
it's very soon you'd be making 25 million a month. Well, absolutely correct. What you've said on the setup cost is fine. However, if you look back at why the firms exited in 2012, 2011, 2012, 2013, the volatility levels were very low. Very low. And therefore, yes. the revenue from globally, including the States, was low and therefore not commercially viable. FX Solutions sold out to gain capital. They did indeed, yes. However, volatility has returned back to the marketplace, one since the Brexit and two since Trump. And there yes. probably other be political motivations that will move the market on. Trump now, Donald Trump, the President of the US, United States, is will be inviting foreign firms to come and work yes, in the indeed. US. Why? By setting up operation, he will lighten up regulation to allow them to employ the local population, which is what his whole banner That's is, right. making America great That's again. That's right. So a foreign firm will probably have lighter regime of regulated probably. paperwork in order to buy probably. by, which will then be enticing for those foreign firms to go back to the states, set up the regulatory, regulatory capital requirement that they need, Most do certainly. the paperwork, and they probably will be very, very profitable if they're willing to stick it out the long term. I agree, that's exactly right. And if I was in that position, if I, if I was a, a, a senior executive within one of those well-capitalized foreign firm, non-American firms, I would right now be filling in the NFA application yeah. form, right now, because yeah. you, it, it's, a, it's the right time. Yeah, it probably is right. Under the present Donald Trump regime, he most be, most he's going to lighten up on the necessary paperwork yes. that's going to be needed. I think so. I think that the real regulatory lightning will be the major banks. The mm -hmm. large banks. He's not really interested in smaller no. stuff, but it will encourage foreign firms to, to be active in America and employ American uh, management teams and serve the public as long as they behave. If it was me, I would be there with a pen in my hand filling in that form right now. So and when I are you going? I don't know, give me 25 million <laughs> and I'll go. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, it's something else. Also, if you're, a, if you're a smaller brokerage, it's worth raising the capital to do it, in my but opinion. But I think the smaller brokerages are making a mistake. What they're doing is they're looking to set up independent operations within the states. Yes, they what are. What they should be doing is they should be doing joint ventures and partnering up with tier one banks. Yes. Tier one banks can only penetrate a certain part of the marketplace. The smaller brokerages can penetrate that level that the tier ones are not penetrating and bring that business to the tier one as either their prime broker, okay, or an STP model, depends on how your individual brokerage is set up, and they could joint venture up with these firms. As long as you've got, that's the thing, it, a 50 million balance sheet will get, a, will get you a tier one prime brokerage agreement with, major, with the banks. Right. So the question is this now, will the venture capital people be more open to going towards funding OTC brokerage now that there's a massive business opportunity in America and very little chance of failure because of the capitalization and risk management rule that you have to abide by. You know, once you've asked for 25 million, asking for 50 million isn't that difficult. You're already there. To, yeah, they're already there. You go to a prime brokerage with it then, can't yeah. you, and do You're exactly as you've there. said. I agree. Yeah, those numbers are very, very, very commandable, and once you get onto the track, they're easy to get. Yes. But the small brokerage, the medium-sized brokerage, small to medium-sized, should be looking at the states as an opportunity now, especially for under the Donald Trump they uh, presidency. They should, and certainly if the FXCM fallout has any positive aspect, now is the time to go to America. Correct. Thank you very much for joining us, Mayor. Pleasure. Mayor Valensky, CEO of Valensky Financial Group. Thank you. I'm Andrew Sachs McLeod, CEO of Finance Feeds. Thank you very much for joining us here today at Ducas Copy TV in Geneva, Switzerland. See you next time. Goodbye.